So this is going to be an interface of uh, quantum and uh, complexity science here. And uh, it really follows the theme of sort of the group that I lead at, uh, in Singapore, which is kind of affiliated with the Complexity Institute at Nanyang Technological University and the Center for Quantum Technologies at NUS. So this is the group here. Actually, a couple of the people here at the moment, Tom Elliott and Alec Boyd. So if you have a chance, talk to them. Uh, Sylvia is here as well, but she's just a baby, so she probably won't talk much science. OK. So however, I mean, uh, we had the pleasure of having Sylvia now around for 18 months. And, uh, and you can really see how she learns from the complex environment. So here's her pointing excitedly at the SQXI poster in the, uh, in the hotel foyer. So, when we have these, uh, so when we observe these babies like Sylvia, it's amazing to see them sort of learn from the environment. And a lot of what they want to do is they act like an agent. They want to sort of understand how the past, whether their actions, how their product affects their future observations. And indeed, that operates no, it's really an entire point of science. All of science we can think of at least most of quantum science, is trying to understand how the past is correlated with the future. We believe that our past observations, our past actions affect the future, or there's really no point in science at all. And if we take that belief, then we believe there's some shared information there. And it's really about isolating what aspects of the past is of relevance to the future. And as we gain better and better understanding of things, we can discard irrelevant information like horoscopes or other things. And, uh, and in doing so, gradually gain a better understanding, uh, uh, the most parsimonious uh, understanding of sort of our observed events. And this really aligns with this philosophy of Occam's razor as espoused by, say, Isaac Newton here, that we should really admit no more causes to natural things than both true and sufficient to explain their appearances. And this also gives us sort of a way of trying to understand the, how complex our environment is by looking at, well, just how much information do we need to track to still retain a complete understanding of the future. And in this sense, another way of looking at it more fundamentally is to think about the universe as really just uh, information processor with information from the past in which uh, continuously flowing to information in the future in sort of this view of a river. And what we're trying to do is we're kind of looking at how much information has to pass through the present to get between the past and the future. And that's really the information that we need to track. And this also gives a fairly convenient way of, under, of sort of quantifying complexity, as we will see soon. So let's look at a special case uh, first to, as a warm up, which is the case of passive processes. So these are from the perspective of a passive observer who just looks at his environment but does not actively sort of interact with it. And in this case, observations can be thought of as random variables. And in the most simple scenario, we can think about an agent looking at the environment at discrete pockets of time. And we can sort of then build up the stochastic distribution where xt is just the statistics of the observation at time t. And this can be then described by a probability distribution that correlates the past with the future. And we can ask, OK, how much information in the past do we need to store inside the present to be able to have sort of complete ability to sort of replicate the statistics of the future. And this is a, a task that's been sort of studied quite extensively in a subfield of complexity science known as computational mechanics. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways of sort of finding one of these optimal models is to reason that if I had two different paths and their conditional futures were statistically indistinguishable, then there should be no reason for me to allocate information to distinguish these paths for the purposes of inferring the future. And so I should be able to take the set of paths and divide them into subsets or equivalence classes and such that each two members within the same subset has the same conditional future statistics. And then we can just take each of these subsets and map them into a particular state of a physical system. And this physical system itself then should contain all the information we need to be able to generate accurate, statistically faithful predictions about the future. And indeed, once we have that state, one can show that one can build 
one of these hidden Markov machines that is able to generate the right future predictions. And we can see from the way the machine operates, we kind of store the relevant past information in this box here. At each time step, we interact that box with a blank tape. And we can see that the only information that propagates between the past and the future is this sort of this causal break here, this causal intermediary. And so the information contained in that line of the circuit contains all the information we need to store about the past. And when we look at that information, we can use various information measures. A popular one, of course, is Shannon entropy that just captures sort of uh, the minimum number of bits I need to encode in the asymptotic limit of simulating many copies of these processes. And then we can start asking, OK, well, how much information do I actually need? So as a first quick example, imagine we're just trying to model a sequence of random coin flips. Uh, then what happens is that Every single past has the same conditional future because the past is not correlated with the future. And so we don't need any information to be able to replicate the future statistics because old pasts are contained in the same causal state. And uh, the intuition of this is that if I was to model a sequence of random coin tosses, I could kind of just close my eyes and throw coins without remembering or tracking any information about the past. And this gives us this idea that something that is completely random is, has no real structure and is not considered very complex. And this is a slide that I shamelessly ripped from Scott's blog, which was shamelessly ripped from one of Sean Carroll's talks in an FQXI conference about eight years ago. And it shows a very nice picture of a coffee cup, showing how our natural, intuition, our natural intuition of complexity is things that are low, highly ordered are fairly easy to describe, and things that are highly disordered are fairly easy to describe. But in the middle, when we have turbulence and everything else, when the milk is mixing with the coffee, things are much more complex. And that kind of aligns with uh, our his, the history of science, where the things that we found the most easy to characterize historically were highly ordered processes like pendulums and highly disordered processes like ideal gas. And these required very few parameters to track. But as we get into more complex systems like agents, adaptation, econom economy, things become a lot more difficult to track. The amount of information we have to pertain and sort of track becomes and scales quite rapidly with the size of these systems. And so we're looking at our measures as measure of complexity, we see fairly similar behavior. Something that is identically zero requires no past information to replicate the future statistics, and neither does something that is completely random. And so as long as this measure gives us uh, something non-zero in the middle, we're kind of on the right track. And, uh, and indeed, this measure was first proposed by Crutchfield when he was a very young man here back in 1989 uh, uh, as a measure of structure, an uh, intrinsic measure of structure of a stochastic process. And recently, there's been a lot of activity. Actually, one of the, my good friends here now is sitting somewhere in the audience. He's going to present something uh, later on about using statistical complexity to detect whether a fly is either unconscious, sedated, or conscious. So you can see that when it's conscious, the fly is, I guess, thinking some fly thoughts a bit more on the right-hand side. And uh, so what we were interested in then is, OK, we've got this interesting measure of complexity. Is, it, uh, is this classical measure fundamental, or can we do something better quantum mechanically? And our first guide is from the classical side is that uh, the, this classical measure, um, th there is room for improvement. And the way to see that is if we took one of these stochastic processes, then the information here is a mutual information between the past and the future. So that's just the amount of information the past contains about the future. And a priori, there's no reason why we need to store more information than this to be able to generate the right future predictions. But it turns out that if we worked out the optimal machines, these epsilon machines, and looked at the memory they needed, in general, for most processes, the amount of memory they need, the statistical complexity, is strictly greater than the mutual information between past and future. So there is some gap here, which I'll call here as a causal waste. And it's information that's irrecoverably wasted during the process of prediction. And, uh, and we were naturally interested in whether this can be reduced. And so let's do a case study. There's meant to be a movie here of one of my postdocs throwing a coin, but uh, it's kind of missing here because it's a PDF file. But the idea is, imagine we saw one of these sequences. And uh, imagine when we look at the statistics, what happens is that uh, sequences of consecutive symbols of the same type, the frequency of occurrence scales exponentially small with the length of that subsequence. And if we had one of these things, 
then we can start looking at, OK, what's the simplest way of modeling one of these things? And it turns out that if we think hard enough, it is one of these, uh, 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 these hidden Markov models with two states. So basically, here, the state here, you can think of, interpret it as just a state of a coin that's either heads or tails. And every time step, what we do is we take this coin, uh, we put it inside a box, and we shake it. Not too hard, because then it will be completely random, but enough so that coin kind of flips between heads and tails with some probability Q. And then we just output the state of that coin. And sure enough, that generates the correct statistics for this process. And it turns out that this is also the simplest way, or the simplest classical causal model of generating the same data. And the idea is that if we lost track of the state of this coin, then we do lose some information about the future. And the question is whether or not we can do better quantum mechanically. And as Seth kindly pointed out, that when it comes to embeddings into quantum systems, we have a much greater degrees of freedom. We no longer just have embedding something in 0 or 1. We can embed things in superpositions of 0 and 1. And that's indeed what we do in this fairly simple example. We take this coin, and if it's in heads, we embed it in this state here. And if it's in tails, we embed it in this state here. The exact details don't, doesn't really matter, but we can just look at these as these two points in a block sphere. And if we take a look at these two points and we look at their statistical mixture, it's somewhere in the middle here, we see this still has some bias in the x measurement direction, which means that uh, uh, the state, even the amount of information that's needed to store well, these two sort of, the mixture of these two quantum encodings is going to be strictly less than one, because there's still some knowledge about this qubit, some bias on this qubit left after the encoding process. And when we do that, we sort of save memory over the optimal classical model. And, and indeed, we can still use that encoding, and we're still able to build a circuit that generates the right future predictions. It looks very similar to the classical epsilon machines. We still have a tape. We still have the quantum system now encoded with the right quantum causal state there. And uh, we have some, instead of a classical stochastic interaction, we have a quantum unitary interaction. But the important part is uh, that the causal intermediary here, what's been passed, between past and future is going to be something of entropy less than one. Indeed, the entire simulator here is going to have entropy less than one as well. And, uh, and when we do this by experiment, so the Howard Wiseman and Griffiths, they kindly did the experiment on this. And we sort of measured the amount of uh, information that's needed by the quantum model. We see that uh, it's significantly less than the classical counterpart. And uh, in, in fact, this sort of, uh, I demonstrated by a simple example, but it's fairly general. If we look at a general stochastic process, as long as there is some finite amount of causal waste, what we can prove is that it's always possible to create one of these quantum machines that sort of can create, generate the same statistics, one of these quantum causal models that sort of uh, stores less, strictly less information about the past than their optimal classical counterparts. And this sort of brings us to sort of a new paradigm, which is to say that we got this fairly uh, established measure of complexity. It's got a fairly good operational interpretation, uh, sort of the amount of information we have to track about the past to predict the future. And when we, general, when we generalize the quantum regime, we get different qualitative behavior. And indeed, you can get cases where the two measures behave with, a, with a, a significant amount of difference. You can get scaling behavior as well. And we were naturally interested in bringing this to the next step to say, OK, OK, what about agents? And uh, could, uh, once we start adding adaptive processes, sort of, uh, could, uh, could quantum agents sort of find certain that the environment just simpler in certain instances. And so here we, can, we look at this you know, sort of a more general scenario, like, uh, like that Sylvia the baby that I pointed out before. She's not just going to look at something. She sees a cup. She's going to smash it. And we had a lot of uh, broken cups in hotels recently. And so they are more of an input-output process. They look at the environment, and they want to do something with it. And in doing so, they affect it. And the question is that to understand what happens in these complex environments, they need to track more information to be able to understand what happens to our environment depending on their future actions. And here things get a little bit more complex, but it's roughly the same idea. Instead of having a stochastic process, we now have a general information transducer. With every time step, uh, what happens is that we can throw something into our environment, and we can see what comes out. And, like, uh, and our agent would like to be able to store enough information about the past here to be able to build the right prediction about the future. 
And now the statistics of such a scenario can be described by a family of an uh, infinite family of stochastic processes, one for each possible choice of input. And the way that we can think about our model is something that takes information about everything we can collect about the past. So every past kick that we did to the system uh, plus every past output we saw. And using that information, it's meant to store that inside some memory so that it's able to generate the right uh, predictions or right behavior what happens to future actions for whichever possible future action the agent may wish to take. So here this is a kind of assumption of free will built in that the agent is able to choose to kick the process in whichever way it feels like. And it wants to be able to track enough information in the past to know what will happen depending on whichever choice. So it can presumably make the right decision. And uh, the model itself gets a bit more complex, but uh, really it's about feeding the input. Instead of blank tape here, at each time say we're going to just feed in the input. And the simplest classical models of these are known as epsilon transducers. And again, we have a causal intermediary here uh, capturing how much information we have to track about the past to be able to generate the right sort of inferences about the future. And again, it can be sort of uh, cast into a kind of a Markov machine. But in this case, uh, the transitions also depend on the input at each time step. And uh, things get pretty complex, but I just want to close off with a fairly simple example. Imagine we're in the Blade Runner scenario, where you were testing an environment here, a fellow agent on whether it is a machine. But here, the Turing test is extremely simple. We just have two questions. One is, do you like electric sheep? And the other is, are you hungry? So we call these question one and question two. And what the agent has to do is it has to either sort of, uh, if we ask the, question, the same question twice, the agent should agree. Otherwise, it should answer something that is completely random. Here we have a state machine. So we've got, so when we look at this, classically what we need is we need four states because we've got two things to track. One, what question was asked, and two, what answer was given. And so the, it turns out that when one, when one builds a classical model of this, we get this four state machine, and depending on what question was asked, there are different transition probabilities. But if we think carefully enough in the quantum regime, the same dynamics can be sort of uh, replicated using a single qubit. Because this is really, uh, uh, this is really just uh, taking a qubit and asking, uh, question one is just x measurements, and question two is just measurements in the complementary basis. And then if you are measuring the same basis twice, you're guaranteed to get the same answer. But if you measure in the complementary basis by the uncertainty principle, you get something that is completely random. And so the whole thing, uh, uh, this whole input-output process, can be mimicked by a quantum system that uses only uh, a, s a single qubit term to encode the past. And indeed, if you put it in the quantum transducer framework, you can sort of view the circuit like this, <coughs> where at every uh, time step, we, get, uh, we use a different input depending on whether we ask question one or question two, and um, we can get the right answer. And indeed, what we can show, whenever the classical model kind of improving on it doesn't violate the information processing inequality, we can do better quantum mechanically. There's some very interesting measures of complexity, and I particularly like this measure, statistical complexity, because it has a very nice operational interpretation. And uh, in terms of sort of our agent trying to understand the future based on information from the past. And when we look at this measure of complexity, just like um, factoring in the computational sense, when we look at this sort of statistical complexity, things behave very differently in the presence of quantum observers and quantum agents. And we're really just beginning to understand the qualitative and quantitative divergences. And I want to end with a few open questions. One of the things is that when we build these models using quantum mechanics, one of the bonuses that we get is that it's sometimes possible to create superpositions of all possible conditional futures. So instead of just having a stochastic sample of one future, we can have a superposition of all futures. And this in itself is really encoding an exponentially large vector in a sort of a, in a linearly growing number of qubits, as Seth Loy has mentioned. So, this, so the question is, can we sort of do some interference experiments and uh, use this as an advantage to be able to learn more about the future than we can do classically? The other thing is, as Suzanne Stell mentioned, one of the things agents would like to do is to be able to minimize the amount of heat they dissipate, because heat, uh, we want something evolutionally speaking, to be more energetically efficient. And, uh, and there are some current results that relate sort of complexity 
with information efficiency. So it might be that these quantum agents could also be more energetically efficient. I'll skip this slide and mention the final thing that uh, we are organizing two satellite workshops as part of the conference in complex systems happening at the 30th of September. They're still open for submissions. If you're interested, do let me know because uh, I think a lot of the talks here will be very relevant to that conference. And uh, so, if, uh, so yeah, just check them out and let me know about those. We're also organizing an FQXI conference that's thankfully funded here in uh, yeah, January 2020. So if you want to spend the winter you know, on a tropical island, check that out. Thank you very much.